All right, hi guys. These are your theme seven um, evolution video notes. So we're going to briefly talk about Charles Darwin, but then we're going to talk about some things for natural selection and how different species were formed. So first of all, who was Charles Darwin? So I'm sure by now you have some sort of working knowledge or you've at least heard of his name. So he was a British naturalist and he traveled on a ship called the Beagle to the Galapagos Islands. Now we all know him for his finch beaks, but what most people don't think about is that he also looked at iguana claws and tortoise shell shapes. So first of all, his finches. So there were many varieties of finch beaks that he noticed on the Galapagos Islands and he concluded that the beak shape of each finch species was suited to the food source. So for example, if we look at these pictures, an insect eater is going to have a beak like this or even like this, something kind of sharp and can easily grab an insect. Whereas a seed eater, depending on the type of seed, so like a larger seed would be this finch, maybe a medium seed would be that finch, but the type of beak is going to allow that finch to be successful and get the most food. Some other observations, he did observe iguanas. So there's two kinds, there's island iguanas and mainland iguanas. He noticed that the island iguanas like this guy here had very large claws. So they're on the beaches, they're climbing rocks. It's important that they don't slip. Whereas the mainland iguanas that were living in trees have very small claws. So this helps them climb the trees and be successful. So in general, Darwin's conclusions was that species generally change over time to adapt to their environment. And this is essentially the working definition we have of evolution. So in terms of an adaptation, this is something that helps an organism survive and reproduce. So his theory is that species change over time, and this is based on all of his observations, his evidence, and everything that has continued to be observed over time. So when we talk about survival of the fittest, this is something you commonly hear. We jokingly will say it in our everyday language, and then of course you hear it when we talk about evolution, but what does it really mean? Now, for example, this is kind of a funny comic, but you see a beaver and he has a chainsaw as a hand. Well, obviously that beaver, if this actually existed, would be much more successful at cutting down trees than this guy over here that's using his teeth. But survival of the fittest simply means the best adapted individuals are going to be the most likely to survive and reproduce. So in terms of the phrase natural selection, which is a word that we hear all the time as well, this is that the environment selects the best adapted individuals, but it does not mean strongest. There are some species of fish, for example, where the large males are slow moving and the wimpy little males are teeny, but they can swim fast and they swim in and they actually fertilize the female fish's eggs before the strong male can get to him. So it doesn't necessarily mean strength. Just because you go to the gym five times a day doesn't mean you're necessarily fit. Whereas like Octomom that had eight kids is technically more fit than someone like that because she's passing on more of her traits. So what affects natural selection? So there's a few things we're gonna talk about. The first is the concept of overproduction. So there are many, many species that produce more offspring than will ever survive. And this also introduces competition. So even within, say, all these turtles down here, the first turtles to make it to the water are going to not be as prone to predators on the beach, but then once they get to the water, there's predators in the water. So the ones that are best adapted, the fastest swimmers, the ones that get out to safety the, the quickest will be the ones that will survive. Whereas the slow ones, they're getting picked off. So you also see this in trees. They produce tons of seeds. And check out all these frog eggs over here. Reintroducing then competition. So of course, organisms are always competing for resources, whether it be food, territory, water, shelter, they're always competing. So there's two types you need to know about. The first is intraspecific, and this is between individuals of the same species. So you see this down here, where you see two bucks fighting. They're more than likely fighting for territory, access to mates, etc. The other type is interspecific, and that's where you see here, this is competition between different species. So think about in Africa, for example, watering holes are very, very important, but it's always a fight to get there, and then of course there's predators in the water. So there's always that competition for a safe spot and the water. 
finally is genetic variation. So the differences in general between individuals look around, right? You look different from your mom, different from your dad, different than your siblings, your cousins, your friends. You look different because everybody has a little bit of variety. So those variations, going back to the concept of meiosis, are from the shuffling of your alleles. So a strong species, this is a really key concept. I'd highlight this or star this in your notes. A strong species has many, many, many variations. You don't want everybody to look the same, to have the same DNA, because then you're very susceptible to risking the loss of your species or just a very big decrease in your population. So there's three types then of variants in a population. So as we talked about, everything looks different, but different types of selection can affect what genes are expressed within a population. So there's three kinds we're gonna talk about, and I have graphs to go along with each of these. So the first being stabilizing selection. So this is where the average phenotype is favored. So the extremes are not favored in this population. The next is disruptive. And disruptive is essentially the opposite of stabilizing. Ooh. All right, sorry for the blip there, um, PowerPoint crash. So we were talking about the different types of variants. So we have stabilizing selection, which is where the average phenotype is selected for. Then you have disruptive selection, which is where the extreme phenotypes are more favorable in a population. And then finally, you have directional selection, which the example we'll talk about with this is something that you're probably familiar with. And this is just where the population in general shifts one direction or the other. So let's look at some graphs. So first of all, what type of selection is this? So as you see, the dotted line was the original. Now we have extremes. So this is disruptive. Next, we have a shift. So this is what I talked about where one of direction kind of shifts more towards the other way. This is going to be your directional. And then lastly, we're selecting against the extremes in favor of the median. So this is, I'll write it here, stabilizing. So here's a couple other reasons why it's really important to have genetic variation within any organism. So for example, the Irish potato famine happened in 1843, and there was a huge lack of variation within potato species. So as a result, there was a single fungus that came and it wiped out the whole potato crop. And then as a result, there was a famine. There's also two types of resistance, and we've talked about these a little bit throughout the year, but the first is pesticide resistance. So the issue here is that pesticides are used on insects, but there's insects that survive the administration of these pesticides, so they reproduce, and then they have more insects that are resistant. So then it results in needing a stronger pesticide, and then you have insects that, that still survive and reproduce again, then you need another stronger one, so it's just this continual process. That's also evident here in antibiotic resistance. So bacteria typically reproduce asexually, but they can swap DNA in stressful environments, which is, for example, when you're using antibiotics if you're sick. So this is why it's important to always take all your antibiotics. If the doctor says 10 days, do it 10 days. Don't stop after three because you feel better because guess what? The only bacteria you killed were the weak ones. The strong ones are still there and they'll probably come back and make you sicker. And this is also how we evolve in superbugs as well. So there's four pieces of evidence for evolution that we're going to discuss. So the first being fossil record. Fossils are very important. From a little kid, you know what a fossil is. It's a record of your extinct species. And there's two types of dating. So the first being relative, which is approximate age. And the second being absolute, which actually uses isotope decay to measure the exact age of the fossil. There's also anatomical evidence. So in anatomical evidence, you have three different things. So homologous, the prefix homo, same structure, different function. Analogous is the opposite. You have a different structure now, but a same function. 
And then vestigial is reduced forms of functional structures that are still functional in other species. So for example, your homologous structures, remember this is same structure. So if you look here, the human, cat, whale, bat, they all have the same bones, which are color coded, but they're all used for vastly different things. So that's where your different function comes in. Analogous is the opposite. So this is different structure. So if you think about it, right, birds have hollow wings, bats have regular wings, and insects, or sorry, bones, and insects have no bones at all, but they all fly. So they all have that different structure, but they have the same function. And then finally, vestigial. So these are just reduced forms. So for example, the ancestors of whales used to live on land and have four legs. So whales still have a pelvis and a femur in their bodies from what used to be those hind legs, but they don't have hind legs anymore. Same thing with snakes. They have reduced structures from what their ancestors used to have as hind legs. There's also molecular evidence. So with molecular evidence, the more similar the DNA is, the closer the relationship of those two species. So for example, dinosaurs and chickens have a lot of DNA in common, which shows that they recently diverged from a common ancestor. And then finally, there's embryonic development. So this just suggests that similar embryonic development, if you look, these are all vertebrates, they all look the same initially and have the same features because they're all from a, a relative, an ancestral relative. So there's some other things that shape evolutionary theory, and we're going to just kind of cruise through these. So first of all is the founder effect. So this is when a new population is established by a very small amount of individuals. So as a result, important to note, there is very little genetic diversity. Another common thing that happens is the bottleneck effect. So this is where a large percentage is killed. So for example, maybe here there's a flood or a tornado or something like that that happens, and only a few individuals survive, and then they reproduce and they repopulate, but that variety of genes isn't really there anymore. Next, we have gene flow. So just in general, every population, there's births and deaths, and there's immigration, which means entering, and emigration, which means exiting. So the next three are really important. So the first one is co-evolution. So this is where one species is directly affected by the evolution of another. So it's very common in mutualistic relationships or predator-prey relationships. So here you see this insect in this flower. As the flower evolves to be longer over time, the insect's going to have a longer antenna to get to the pollen. Next is convergent evolution. So in convergent evolution, this is where unrelated species evolve similar traits over time. And these are usually analogous structures again, right? So that different structure, same function. And a good example here is sharks and dolphins. So both of them have streamlined bodies, they have dorsal fins, they have tails, and they're both very successful ocean predators, but they don't have a recent common ancestor. Sharks are fish and dolphins are mammals. And then the other one is divergent. So when you think of something diverging, you think of something splitting. So in divergent evolution, you have one that through variation over time, moved into two different organisms. And then finally, adaptive radiation. So adaptive radiation is kind of a more intense version of divergent evolution, just in terms of this time one species gives rise to many. And the most commonly referred to here are the cichlid fishes in Africa, but then also Darwin's finches. So Darwin's finches, their beaks show there's also genetic drift. So this is where the genotypes vary within a small population, but as some die or individuals die, or you see here get squished, the genes are going to shift. And this goes back to those graphs that we were looking at. And then lastly, artificial selection. So this is intentional reproduction of individuals with desirable traits. So if you look here, the wolf is the common ancestor of all of your pet dogs you have. But we selectively, over time, bred them to have all these different species, or breeds, excuse me, not species. All dogs are one species. This is also evident in farm crops. All right, that's it for your notes.